Well, welcome to this tutorial which is going to have a look at the various ways of manipulating time in Houdini. And of course, by manipulating time, what we mean is evaluating a bit of a scene at a different frame from the current frame. And I've got an example here which I've built uh, already, and I'm not going to go over all of it in detail because it's stuff I've covered in other videos. Uh, but we've got a bird model here. Obviously it's uh, very primitive. It's uh, just representing a bird. So we have some animation on the wings of the bird, like so. And that's just achieved here by using a sign function on one of the wings and copying the channel across onto the other wing so that it behaves in the equal and opposite way. So we've got a bit of animation on the bird, and the other thing we've got is a particle system. And let's have a look at that. The particle system starts with a line with some number of points on it. Can't really see them at the moment, but there are about 10 points on there. And then we feed that into a pop net, which sources five particles a second from the points of that line. And then we have an interact pop and all this is doing is forcing the particles apart from each other if they get too close. So we can see that the particles fly off with a slightly random velocity and if they get too close they're forced apart. So what we want to do is to instance a bird to each of those particles. So let's assume for a moment that my birds are really expertly modelled and animated and we want to instance them onto the points of this particle system to create some kind of flock of birds effect. So the first thing I'd want to do is to object merge in. Oh, of course I'm in my the wrong level. Let's object merge in our bird, so I want to find the bird which is here and just merge that in and we can see it. Uh, but if let's just leave it there, so that's flapping away. And we're going to have to make it a little bit smaller, so let's put a transform node in here. And I'm just going to scale it right down to, say, 0.2. And then I'm going to use a copy SOP to copy it onto each of the points that's being created out of our particle system. Let's just do that. And the selection here. And we can see, first of all, that our birds are still a little bit, little bit too big. So let's make them a scale of 0.1. The other thing is that they're facing in the wrong direction. So I'm going to rotate them 90 degrees around the y-axis. So now we can see that those are indeed properly flying. But we can see that rather unrealistically, what's happening is that the wings of all of the birds are flapping exactly in sequence with each other. And of course that's not natural. So this is where a time operator becomes useful. And let's see how we can change that uniformity of the flapping using a time SOP. And the, the node that we want to use is the time shift node. Let me insert one in here. At the moment it's not going to do anything because what it does is take uh, the current frame and evaluate the network above it here at the current frame. And that's just going to produce the, the effect that we, that we currently have here. So in order to make sure that each of the birds is being evaluated at a different time, and therefore its wings will be in a different position, we're going to need to add something random, a random offset to the frame number. 
So let me show you how to do that. I'm going to use the copy stamping technique. So if we go onto the copy shop and select the stamp tab, and we say stamp inputs, I can call a variable here, let's call it T shift. And I'm going to type in an expression, rand dollar PT. That's going to produce a random number between 0 and 1 for each of the points coming in here. And each point gets a different random number. And then let's times that by, say, 20. So it's going to produce a random number between 0 and 20. So what we want to do is add that random number, which is different for each point, into this time shift SOP. We do that using a copy stamp expression. So let's say stamp, open bracket. So the first thing we need to do is the scope. In other words, the node that's setting up the copy stamping, which is our copy node. Then the name of the variable, which I called T shift. And then a default value, which we'll have as zero. So let's rewind our simulation. And we can now see that each of the birds has a different position of its wings. It's not terribly clear, but that is actually happening. In fact, perhaps if we increase the value of this here to 40, which is the entire cycle, we can see it a bit more clearly. So we can see it here. This bird has its wings directly up, and this one has its wings down. So that's basically how to evaluate things at different time frames in Houdini. Well, let's deal with a couple of subtleties or complications with this. Uh, and one of them is just to say that if we were using some complicated simulation here, where it was very expensive to calculate this network, uh, we might want to put in a cache SOP in here. Now we don't really need it in this case because actually the evaluation of this network at different frames is virtually instantaneous. There's no real time pilot penalty. Uh, but I can, for example, cache the first 300 or 240 frames in this case, which is the entire simulation and I can cache it and then that would ensure that this time shift will work a little bit more quickly. Let's rewind our simulation and in fact in this case it's slowing it down because that network was so quick to evaluate so we don't really need it but it's worth bearing in mind if you're thinking that your network is slow to evaluate. Let's get rid of the cache Another trick you can do with time is the time warp SOP. Now what a time warp SOP does is take an initial range and make it into a new range. So just to be very, very radical, I'm going to take the first six frames and I'm going to make them into our entire animation of 240. So what this is doing is it's taking the first six frames coming in here and it's spreading them out across the whole of our range of 240. In other words, it's creating a sort of slow motion effect. Let's have a look at that. So for a start, nothing appears for a while. And now we've got something appearing. And if we can see right, it's a bit hard to see. Let's just have a look at this thing and zoom in on the wings. We can see that the wings are not moving for a number of frames and then they suddenly move. So they're not moving smoothly, they're sort of stepping in a jittered fashion. And I wanted to explain uh, why that's happening. Well, in fact, to demonstrate the problem, or rather the solution to the problem a little bit more clearly, I'm going to take my time shift, time warp rather, and I'm going to apply it just directly 
to a single instance of the model, like so. And the reason I'm doing that is because the solution that I'm going to show you doesn't work well when the number of points in the geometry is changing. And of course, as new birds appear from our PopNet, uh, we're going to find that the number of points overall in the geometry is changing radically and the, and the method I'm going to show you won't therefore work. But let's just show you this. So let's see the problem again. The problem is that we're getting this staggered movement of the wings. And the solution is to use a time blend SOP. And the time blend slop, SOP, let's just move that up here, the time blend SOP will smooth that out and you can see that those wings are now moving correctly. Now of course uh, this is a fairly trivial example uh, but uh, there are real situations where you can't easily evaluate a network at fractal in fractional intervals of time. Uh, one example would be where you've saved your geometry out to a file with one file for each frame. And then, of course, you can't easily evaluate it at half frame. And there the time blend will come in very useful. Another thing you can do with the time warp is to set up cycling. And I'll show you that now. So I've got a second version of the bird, which hasn't got a sign expression defi defining the animation. And of course, with a sign expression, uh, that will evaluate at any frame. It, it, it's not limited in time. Instead, I've just keyframed some animation on this. And we can have a look. If we go into the channel editor, uh, we can see this keyframing going from a value of 20 down to minus 20 and back to 20 again. And that's uh, defined over the first 40 frames and thereafter stops. So. If I was to just zoom out, we can see that my wings will move, and then after 40, frame 40, they just stop. Now, there are a number of ways uh, that you can fix this cycling issue, and you can use chops to do it. Uh, you can use motion effects. You could just right click on here, select motion effects. You won't be able to see this on the video, but there's an option to cycle, and that allows you to create a cycle effect on your animation, but I just wanted to show you how we would do it using a, a time SOP. So let me go back into our particle system and I'm going to take out my time blend and attach the time warp back to the end of the network. Now I know that my animation is defined over the first 40 frames so I'm just going to take the first 40 frames and repeat them. So the input range 1 to 40 is the same as the output range. So we're not going to have any time stretching going on. But what I can do here on the post extend option is select cycle. So what this should mean is that as my birds come out, they are cycling. Now the problem here is of course that they start reappearing. So in fact uh, I've put this in the wrong place. I would need to have this node here before the copy sop and then it will just cycle the animation not all of the pop network and there we go. We can see that that is now cycling right up to frame 200 or so. So that's another use of the time warp node. A couple of final remarks before we leave this topic. One of which is that you can use chops to vary the timing of your animation. And if you have a look at the video series I did on chops animation, there's an example of how to do that by offsetting uh, the animation from a single object and then applying it to several other objects. And the other thing I would just say is that the
expression language comes with variants of the channel functions and if you remember the channel function in the expression language returns the value of a parameter there is an equivalent called chf and the chf expression fun function takes a second argument which is the frame number and that will evaluate the channel at a particular frame and that can be useful in terms of varying the animation from one parameter to another. And all of the channel function variants have a channel f variant as well, so things like evaluating ramps and so on you can do at different frames. So that's the end of this tutorial. I hope it's been useful.